Um, all right. I think, I think we're in a good enough spot now. There's, uh, eh, there's 200 people in here. Let's talk about Oklahoma and South Carolina. The Spencer Rattler Bowl, if you will. The Austin Stogner Bowl, if you will. The Shane Beamer Bowl, if you will. Who boy. Um, Dog, Oklahoma's a three-point favorite, but that's because that game's at Oklahoma, not because Oklahoma's that much better than South Carolina. I don't mind telling you. I don't know who's got the better quarterback. I don't. Lenore Sellers ain't that great. Michael Hawkins Jr. ain't that great. The difference between Michael Hawkins Jr. and Jackson Arnold is one dude don't throw the ball away, put the ball on the ground. And as bad as it is to say, that is the bar right now at Oklahoma. And I ain't happy about it. Meanwhile, I watched South Carolina damn near beat Alabama. And I know Alabama is a better football team than Oklahoma. I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about it at all. And we're going to focus on the offense here because we all know that the defense is good. We all know that the defense can take away the ball. And they might against South Carolina a couple of times. We know the defense can stop the run. Yes, Kendall Dolby uh, is out. Yes, we can be a little bit suspect on the back end, but we're going to get home, right? We're going to be exotic in the look. We're going to blitz when they don't expect, and we're going to get home. If we can force Lenore Sellers to hold the ball, we got a shot here. Rocky Sanders gets loose, cancel Christmas. Meanwhile, I'm not going to do to Seth Luttrell what it did to Mike Stoops. Because I, you know, I regret that. I don't want to do that again. Before I was doing this, like for real, it's fun. And then people took it real seriously. And you get in people's feelings that way. I am going to say it was surprising when I read that Seth Luttrell did not talk to the offense following the game in the locker room at Texas. And when you're listening to his interview and you're reading the transcript of what he said and you're trying to piece together, is there anything in here I can hold on to that makes me feel better about what Seth Luttrell is trying to do with that offense? The answer is no. The answer is no. I mean, it's all the same sort of things that I used to hear from Mike Stoops, which is we have to play better, which is we have to execute the game plan. All these things that put it back on players. I realize that players got to make plays, but players realize that players got to make plays. And I've got to tell y'all, man, there's nobody that wants to win more than a bunch of 17, 18, 25-year-old dudes playing football. They understand. They get it. I mean, they got it from home. They got it from their family. They got it from friends. They know what it means. And the last thing they want to do is be hung out to dry. Okay? Not saying that's what happened, but if you are putting it back on them and their execution, how does that going to land if uh, not on them? Not on the game plan that you are putting in place. Don't take many deep shots, right? Can't protect the quarterback. Can't run the ball. And there is nobody available that we like, that we love, at wide receiver. In this game against Texas, there's no Deion Burks, there's no Jaleel Farouk, there's no Nick Anderson, there's no Andrew Anthony. Arguably your four best receivers. So what do you do? I would, me, I'm running two tight end sets all the time. I'm going to make sure that Bauer Sharp sees the ball. You know, I'm going to ask Javante Barnes, Gavin Sawchuk, or Lord help me, Taylor Tatum, to run the football. I've said this before, and I'll say this again. Taylor Tatum might turn out to be a really great player, but right now, he can't pass protect, and he will put the ball on the floor. I can't have a running back that's going to put the ball on the floor, and I damn sure can't have one that can't pass protect. Okay? That's, that's that. Okay? However, when I look at what Oklahoma didn't do against Texas, and I see 2.3 yards per carry, and then I look up, and I just check on Wisconsin Rutgers. I just looked around, and I said, 42-7. Damn. They must have had Braden Lock go off. No, it was... Tyree Walker. It was the tailback at Oklahoma last year who was not on scholarship. He rushed 24 times for 198 yards. Make me understand how that's a good look for Oklahoma. Like, everybody want to talk about Dylan Gabriel, right? And I keep trying to tell everybody the math for Dylan Gabriel is the math. It's just, it, 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 that's how it goes. They knew that he was going into the NFL draft after the 2023 season. And they knew, like he knew, that Jackson Arnold was going to be the heir apparent. Then Jackson Arnold threw for 363. 
two TDs, two picks, in a, against Arizona in a game they lost, and everybody felt good about that. That part is true. Dylan Gabriel gets draft grade that is not great, says, I would like to play another year of college football to try to see if I can't move up, goes to Oregon and has an opportunity to not only play for a national championship, Big Ten championship, but win the Heisman Trophy. On the other side, Brent Venables promotes an analyst who is a former head coach and a former player at Oklahoma to be in the offensive coordinator, co-offensive coordinator with another guy who was a former coordinator and former tight end at Oklahoma and Joe John Finley. But we all know that Seth Luttrell is up there in the booth calling plays. One of the reasons as to why is Seth Luttrell and Jackson Arnold had a really great relationship. Still have a really great relationship. So you're going to ride that. And I believe in that, right? Because when Lincoln had these things rolling in Oklahoma, he would talk about Baker, Kyler, Jalen like they were little brothers. It's a peer-to-peer relationship when you have a play caller and a coordinator. Uh, excuse me, a play caller and a quarterback. And it has to be, I think. I don't think that can be a boss to employee relationship like it can for other parts of football. You got to be in sync. You got to see it the same way. And if you don't, you got to find a way. One of the things I love about great play callers and great offense coordinators, really great coaches, they know what I know. It is not incumbent upon a player to know you. It is incumbent upon you to know a player. If you can't speak his language, that's your fault. It is not incumbent upon him to speak yours. You need to get the best play out of him because he's the guy in the arena. He's got to make it happen. My favorite story about this is Mike Leach at Washington State when he had Connor Halliday at quarterback. They ran air raid, like you know, but Connor Halliday was a really great quarterback for Mike Leach. Threw for a ton of yards. There was a game for which Mike Leach at one point just sent in a formation. Not a play, a formation. So essentially, shotgun. Strong side. And then Connor Halliday was like, is there, is there a second half to this play call? Is there, what are we running inside of shotgun? Strong side. To which he called timeout, and Mike lost his mind. He was pissed. He was so angry on the sideline. And Connor's like, I didn't get to play. I don't know why you're mad at me. He said, you're the quarterback. Call the play. You see it. I don't see it. You see it. You know what you're looking at. Go do what I what you have trained to do, what I have taught you to do. Just go act, man. It's it's actually one of I mean, I, I love Top Gun Maverick to death. It's one of my favorite movies. And when I'm on my my motorcycle, I, I do believe that I'd be Pete Mitchell down there. But the reason I love Top Gun Maverick is because it really does put a light on instinctual athleticism, right? What makes Pete Mitchell Pete Mitchell isn't that he studies. He actually sucks at studying. It isn't that he's a great team player. It's actually a really crappy team player. As many single-seaters are, and I'm a single-seater. I get it. Hangman's a single-seater. That's why we single-seaters. We, we need to be out there by ourselves. But what he would say is, don't think, just do. Don't think, just do. Forget the book, go. You have done this enough. When people talk about the 10,000 hours and they take it out of context going, well, 10,000 hours later, I'm a master. No. Have you put yourself in as many situations as possible To have an idea of what's going to happen next. It's called chunking. You know, I play a lot of chess. I play a lot of video games. One of the things that you learn is how to adapt to a situation based on what you've seen before. The more situations you see, the more you're going to be able to make the right choice. One of the things I love most about a chess board is that there are only, only so many moves you can make. There are only 64 squares. And the moves you can make shrink with each play. With, with each move by, by you and your opponent, there's only so many ways this could go. So it becomes less about being good at identifying strategy and better about what is going on over here. What is going on over there? When you hear about great quarterback play, one of the things you learn is, does that guy read left to right? Does he lead one side of the field? Does he read a particular section? There's all sorts of ways to do this. I like going triangles. I like creating triangles on, on a football field, right? If I know that I have a matchup that I like, how do I manipulate it into where, A, I'm going to get the matchup I like, but B, I have two other options I can immediately go to. And then I don't have to worry about that other side of the field if I don't want to. I don't see any of that from Seth Luttrell's offense. I see quarterbacks with one read who don't know what to do next. That has to change. And I don't know that hiring a quarterback's coach is going to help that. I mean, Kevin Johns is there, right? Lowry's there. You have, like, I think, actually, the quote that Brent Venables gave is, we have a small army of quarterbacks coaches. 
and probably drives him up a wall because he's a defensive coordinator going, how hard is this really? I'm calling defense. I got the harder job over here, dog. Playing defense is always going to be more difficult than playing offense in football. It is an offensively loaded sport. How is it so difficult to teach a quarterback how to run your offense? However, I do think there are things that both Jackson Arnold and Michael Hawkins Jr. do very, very well. Otherwise, you don't get to Oklahoma. And I think that it is a past time for coaches to figure out what those things are and to call plays to those strengths. I'm, I'm d- d- dead up, guys. Like One of the things that even in my job that I struggle with, that I think many of my peers struggle with, is what do you think you do well? And then what do the people around you think you do well? And how many times do those things overlap? Setting people up to win. Setting people up to do what you know they can do well and what they think they can do well. Because when you're winning, you can do anything. That's what you feel. And I so much playing football is I feel like I can whoop that guy in front of me. I feel like I've been prepared to do that. If you don't, you're going to lose a lot of football games. Because you're going to lose a lot of plays. And then your spirit is going to get beaten down. And it is much more difficult to build somebody's spirit back than to just gas them up, man. It's one of the reasons that we love a hype man. One of the things that people tell me about this show. I love your charisma. I love your passion. That's because it's real. It's because it's authentic. That's because it's what I love. This right here, doing it right now with you. Take that away and, and I'm not going to be as good at other things. I'm just not. You have to find a way. I remember this in uh, Any Given Sunday, right? We're talking to uh, Dennis Quaid is talking to Jamie Foxx. And he's going, you need to hand Julian, LL Cool J, the ball and give him a touchdown or else he's going to fold. Now, does that feel shallow? Yeah. You want somebody to just play through it. But Dennis Quaid is not going to argue strategy. He knows what's going to make that guy go. And you're going to need him in pass protection. You're going to need him to make plays for you that aren't him touching the ball. The only way that you can ensure that is by making sure he scores a touchdown. So they call it a play. They hand him the ball. He goes, he t- uh, scores the football, right? Scores a touchdown. You have to know that stuff about your teammates. You have to know that stuff about your coworkers. That is actually getting to know people, you know? I wonder how much of that is going on. And I wonder just, I mean, I had a football coach that I loved who made it his job to know everybody's favorite color, everybody's favorite rapper, everybody's favorite movie, just all the way down the list of what is basically a character study. And then he would pull on those things. He would demonstrate to you. I had, I had a football coach, God bless him. He made D&D references, dog. Because we had one guy who was really into it, uh, would run a game, you know. He, he was about, about them 12-sided dies. Yeah, and... <laughs> I never forget, football coach saw him make a play that was instinctual. Like, he ripped, he was a defensive end. He ripped, he swum, and he got home to the quarterback. And he said, see, I told you, you a natural 20. You a natural 20 out here, dog. And I, that man lit up. He was, that, just, that defensive end was on fire the rest of the game because coach got him, and coach gave him a compliment that he could take with him onto a football field. I love those stories. I really do. I say this with all intention of it landing, though. If Oklahoma struggles to move the football against South Carolina, it's going to be bigger than Seth Cottrell. It's going to be bigger than the offense. The next question that people are going to ask, if they haven't already, is, is Oklahoma new Nebraska? Like new Coke. Don't nobody like new Coke. New Nebraska ain't really like being new Nebraska. You change conferences. You go to a place where you don't really know the people, but you really want to be there, and you proceed to get your head handed to you. Oklahoma 4-2 and two right now, right? It, it, that's, it's, it's two games for me and 4-4, four and four, and, then, and then, we, then, we, then we in trouble, trouble. Because this schedule this year is, it's a monster, okay? The only win left is Maine. And I hope that the Black Bears ain't take the Super Serum before they get here. Otherwise, we up a creek real bad. Need to get that figured out. Another game that I want to take a look at in the SEC, Arkansas at LSU. I think Arkansas is going to beat LSU. I'll tell you why. Sam Pittman has something going on at Arkansas that I feel will always work, given it time. He has supreme belief 
in his players and in his staff, and he is holding the line for them. He has made it very clear to everybody. I expect Taylor Green to be back. It looks like more of a bone bruise than it does an MCL injury, which is great news for all of us because I really like watching Taylor Green play football, but they need him. Malachi Singleton did a job to get them over the line against Tennessee, but he, he, he can't do that against LSU. And LSU is going to throw the football. The reason they're going to throw the football is they got this dude, Garrett Nussmeyer, the LSU fan can't seem to like. I don't know why y'all don't like that man. That man is purple and gold through all the way through. And I, I love Garrett Nussmeyer. I, I want great things for Garrett Nussmeyer, especially after what he did against Ole Miss to go get that win. By the way, a game that they lost last year with Jaden Daniels at quarterback. He beat Ole Miss. Okay? Beat Ole Miss Tiger Stadium. I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, Travis Williams seems to be locked in as defense coordinator finally at Arkansas. Can he get home against Garrett Nussmeyer? Probably. Will he send more than is appropriate? Probably too. Can Kyron Lacey win on the outside and can Caden Durham bust loose? Caden Durham bust loose, it's going to be a long day for Arkansas. Because then Garrett Nussmeyer knows he can get one-on-ones and he's as good as anybody in the country at picking those dudes apart. Okay? I think, I think Arkansas is going to use that home field advantage for all it's worth because Arkansas fans, now they believe it too. Spent the last three months on this show telling Arkansas fans, I like your team. Sam likes your team. And they're like, nah, dog, we, we Arkansas. Like... I don't really like Sam. Like, I, I'll sell out for Sam. He's one of them dudes I absolutely positively love. I can't, I couldn't tell you more how much I like a head coach more than I like Sam Pittman. But I also was hearing it from players. Like, Landon Jackson was very loud about, hey, we taking people to ground in the preseason. I think that's going to change us. We're ready to hit. You know, they take that loss against Oklahoma State in a game that they probably should have won. Just didn't go their way in the way that we thought. They talk, take a loss against a Texas A&M team that we all of a sudden all think is pretty decent now. And then they go knock off Tennessee by basically running Oklahoma's defensive game plan and doing enough offensively and getting the best game so far of his Arkansas career out of Taylor Green. 19-26, 266 against that Tennessee defense that was coming after him. Is Tennessee a better football team than LSU? Yes. Yes is the answer to that question. But will the Arkansas team that showed up to beat Tennessee be the one that showed up to beat LSU? That is an open question. I think that they're going to get it done. I do. It's not because I don't think the LSU is good. It's because that game is in Fayetteville. It has meant the world this year to go into other people's places to play. Alabama went into Vanderbilt and was handed their head. Tennessee went into Arkansas and was handed their head. Ole Miss went into LSU and was handed its head. Keep keep going down here, right? Like, I can't be much more clean than that. It is getting difficult to go into other people's places and expect to win in that league. Again, that's why I think Oklahoma's got the the three-point advantage. That game is in, in Oklahoma, right? But I like Arkansas in this game, and that doesn't mean that I don't like LSU. I just like Arkansas in this spot. I really do. Illinois, I think, is going to beat Michigan, but I'm not going to go too far into that except to say I think that Michigan doesn't have a quarterback, and Illinois does. Luke Altmaier went for 379, scored 50 in a win against Purdue just last week. They're moving to football. They play great defense. I honestly think that Illinois could win that by double digits. It might not even be that close. And then the big game on the menu that I don't think enough people are talking about, Indiana, Nebraska. Indiana has been mopping the floor with its competition, okay? Has it played somebody that you respect yet? Not really. But I think it is important to note they are the first team this year to win six games, 6-0, first time since 1967. They are ranking ninth in the country in third down efficiency, 54%. Fourth in yards per game, 515. Second in scoring, 47 and a half. If you put Indiana in Penn State's uniforms, you would call Indiana the third best team in the country. That's what it is. And matter of fact, if you're an Indiana fan, you're looking at Penn State at number three, you're looking at you at number 16 going, what the hell is this? It's the blue blood tax exemption. That's, that's what Penn State got. They got the blue blood tax exemption. We give it to people. You know, that's, 
I think the reason Texas is still number one and Oregon's number two, right? Texas has won something. Oregon has not. That said, Kurt Signetti is living up to his word. And I, I want to unpack this because I've been hard on him about this. And then he actually gave us a little bit more air that makes me feel a little bit better about it. So last December, he gets hired as the head coach at Indiana. And it's Indiana, right? You're coming from James Madison, right? Coming from a team that was FCS school like three years ago. And you said, I win. Google me. And I'm going, yeah, all right, dog. Uh-huh. And you know what? If you Googled him, you'd probably find what I found. Kurt Signetti has never coached a losing season as a head coach. Not once. Not one time. He is 125 and 35 going into this year. Now he is 131 and 35. That, that's a wild record. Only one that's, uh, I think, comparable is Kalen DeBoer, who has lost all of 13 games as a head coach over 20 years. That's ridiculous. And then later this, uh, or earlier this week, he said this. He said, look, because um, they're getting sellout games. They're getting a lot of people that are interested in Indiana football. And he doesn't have to do the sort of selling that he thought he had to do when he first got to Indiana. The quote that he gave is, you know, I made a couple of comments when I first got hired. I was out there on a limb a little bit. Felt like that's what I needed to do. I think it's more of a reflection on how the team has played and the success that they've had on the field that's gotten people excited. And this is just a byproduct of that. That is what I expect from a head coach. It is a man who was going, nope, I need to do a little psychological warfare over here just to get the engine started. But once the engine got rolling, you can see who's making it work. Curtis Work is making it work. I bet y'all didn't even know that dude was from Canada. That dude was slinging it as a Titan in Hamilton, Canada. Then he went to Ohio. And then he transferred to Indiana, where he has been cooking people. He had been thrown for three bills on the regular. Like, they got a squad out there. And it is a bunch of guys alongside him that are great football players, but not any stars, right? Like, yeah, Jalen Walker, at linebacker, he's coming back, but you don't really have stars. Like, Colorado has a star. Boise State has a star. Ohio, Ohio State has stars. You know what I'm saying? They don't really have that in Indiana. But they be, if they beat Nebraska this weekend, people are going to learn more about them because that game's on Big Noon. So Gus and Joel are calling that game, and that's the primetime game for Fox. I think if they're able to beat Nebraska, you're talking about a team that could be in them running for the Big Ten Championship if things shake their way. Because you beat Nebraska, you get Washington, Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State, Purdue. I think that they win every last one of those games, save Ohio State. And then you're talking about being 11-1. Depending on what happens to Oregon, what happens to Penn State, what happens to Ohio State, you could find Indiana in the Big Ten Championship. In a year where we don't have divisions. In a year where they're usually in the East and they'd be looking up at Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan. It's wild. But the best offense that Indiana has faced so far is Maryland. And Maryland's offense ain't spectacular. It's good. It ain't spectacular. And the defense that Curtis Work is going to be throwing against is good. Is it outstanding? No, but it's very good. Nebraska ranks 13th in total defense, 18th in tackles for loss, 26th in takeaways, and have recorded seven interceptions in six games. They're allowing just 11 points per game. 11 points per game on this defense, 47 plus on that Indiana offense. That's where the game is going to be decided. I don't think that Dylan Riola is going to throw the ball to Indiana, but if he did, that, that's a problem, right? You're going to need to get a run game out of them. You can't ask the true freshman quarterback to carry it, but he has been playing well in a year for which any other year, we're talking about Dylan Riola as the best freshman in all of college football, but because Jeremiah Smith and Ryan Williams exist, it's just not going to be what it is this year, man. Like, I am really, really interested to see what Dylan Riola can do in this spot. Because Nebraska gets a win against Indiana. They're going bowling for the first time since 2016. And they're probably going to vault into the top 25. Probably going to knock Indiana out and they're going to get in. Because people have been up on Nebraska longer than they've been up on Indiana. As a matter of fact, Nebraska was getting more hype for being 3-0 and than Indiana is getting hype for being 6-0. and that is, That's the blue blood tax exemption. We have known Nebraska to be good over the last 50 years, these last 10 years notwithstanding. We have not known Indiana to be nothing like that, right? Michael Penix Jr., Ty Freifogel, that's about as close as we got here in recent times. You got to take it all the way back to Antoine randall the last time that we was talking about 
somebody really making us get up out of our seats that we want to see play at Indiana. Maybe Tevin Coleman, right? Maybe. But I think that either way, somebody's going to come out smelling like roses with a win here. And that's that's really great for the sport. Indiana being an upstart up there with Army, up there with Navy as one of the more surprising undefeated teams in college football is great for, for the sport. If Nebraska can get to six wins, though, man, I've said this before. I love college football when Nebraska and Arkansas are good because it's two fan bases that will sell out for their squad. And it is two fan bases that know that they root for the pro team in their state. And that matters. I don't give a damn who you are. One of the reasons that I get to do this show is because Oklahoma is the pro team in the state. I know the Thunder are here. Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, James Harden, whatnot. Love it. Scotty Brooks, great. But the pro team has been the pro team since the 19th century. And when the pro team is good, the entire state is better. Okay? When the pro team is bad, whew, we can't wait for softball season to get here, dog. <laughs> It'd be like that sometimes. It'd absolutely be like that. All right. That is going to do it for tonight's live episode of the number one college football show. If you like the show, please subscribe to the channel. We're closing in on 115,000 subscribers. Be very cool to get there by the end of week eight this weekend. You can help us with that just by hitting the subscribe button. Helps other people discover the channel. Gives you more people to argue with that aren't me in the comments, and that's always a good time. For the most part, I'd be in there, and I'd be having a good time. I hope you're in there, and you're having a good time too. All right, I will see y'all tomorrow. Doses.